Hi, this is Pastor Bob. Welcome to day number two of learning from old people not to fret in the things of life. David started in Psalm 37 talking about things he has seen in his life, but now begins to warn young people, don't get so upset. Don't get worried about what's going on. In fact, one of the best things you can do is talk to an older person and find out how God has brought them through and realize something, the God that took care of them, the God will take care of you. So let's go to the Word of God together and find out about God's wisdom through those who are older. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome back again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. And I am continuing with what I taught on yesterday from Psalm 37 about advice from old people. We need old people around. I, that's why, you know, I go to a church right now that there's such a vast, wide array of people. It's almost like it's just equal. There's this huge group of, of children, you know, moms and dads and little children, newborns. Pastor said here just a number of weeks ago, he said we have 20 pregnant women in the church. He said, that's just the ones I know about. And he said, you know, we're going to have a big population explosion here when those kids hit and, and all that. But then there's the, you know, then there's young kids. I mean, we're talking, you know, five, six, eight year old kids up into teenage years, then the young marrieds and, uh, and youth department, it just goes on, on all the way up to a huge group of older people. And they all get along so well. This is what God's desire is. And that the young people can learn from the old people. Well, the old people can learn from the young people too. It's just a little harder for old people to learn how to operate their cell phones and all the different things, you know, YouTube and all those other things we have out there today. And it's fun to watch the, the young people teach them how to do this. The old people kind of scratch their head. But on the other hand, what young people need from old people is, the, is their advice. And old men are needed. Old women are needed for counsel, for wisdom. And again, in the church, especially for finances, because so many of the older people have a good amount of finances. You also need older people's wisdom. You don't need older people's ideas. Ideas, or they'll find the carpet colors they want. The carpet designs look something from the 50s or 60s. You know, that's where you need younger people. You need some advice too from, you know, people that uh, do interior decorating and things like that. But on the other hand, what you need from old people is their wisdom, how they have come through the trials of life. And young people, I can honestly tell you, you want to save years of learning things and have it now, go and talk to an old person and tell them, this is what I'm facing. And that, listen, they may not give you a lot of scripture, but they will do what David what David did in Psalm 37. I once was young, now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. They'll give you testimonies of how the word worked, not necessarily what the promise was. They might mention the promise, but they don't preach at you. They just like to tell stories about what happened to them and listen to what they're saying because they're going to save you years of trying this and trying that. And you'll begin to understand something. Well, this is what pastor means when he says, trust God. And most of the time you say, I'm going to trust God, but then you fret and worry and get all up in things. And you think I've got to settle this thing. Well, there's a lot of things you can settle or help to settle, but God ultimately will settle everything. In the meantime, God's called you to a life to be enjoyed. So we were in Psalm 37 yesterday. The book I am using is Leadership Secrets of David the King. This is Psalm 131. Four points on leadership, but David has learned these through the years. And simply sharing four points with you that you don't have to go out there, work for years, and finally come and say, oh, I understand this, and find out David had in the Bible all the time. David was a man that the older he got, the wiser he got, and he wrote more scripture in his older years than he did in his younger years, because why? He's sharing all this information with those around him. I want to read, we have here a praise report from Chad. And Chad's talking about the things that we teach on the broadcast here. And he says, awesome stuff. Thank you, Pastor Bob. Short and to the point. You know why? Because listen, I'm 70, I'll right now 75. And so I don't know when you're gonna be watching this because by the time you watch it, I'll be older than that. But I will say this, at 75, I can look back and say a lot of things I have learned. But the main things I have learned, I've listened to tapes, and I've, you know, listened to uh, flash drives, things like that, all the recorded things on ministers that were older. And many of them have gone on to be with the Lord right now. But the point is, they not only preach the word of God, they share from their experiences and they do what David said here in Psalm 37 and verse 24. I once was young. 
Now am I old? And here he wraps it up in one simple phrase, I've never seen. Notice he doesn't give a scripture on this. He simply gives a testimony. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed, his children begging bread. He wraps up his entire life in one simple phrase. All my lifetime, I have seen God take care of the righteous and God take care of their children. And here you are fretting over what's gonna happen to you and your house and the economy and what's gonna happen to the world situation. Then if, listen, if they come and kill me or take me away or I die, what's my children gonna do? They're gonna trust in the same God that you do because you know what? Maybe your parents were Christians and they thought the same thing, but they're in heaven now. And I can tell you the first thing's gonna happen when they get to heaven, they're gonna realize, oh, my kids are gonna be okay. They're going to be fine. And you need to have that on earth and not wait till you get to heaven to understand I will never be forsaken or my children end up begging bread on the streets. So let's kind of take a look at Psalm 37. Psalm 37 has two aspects to it, looking backward and looking forward. And first of all, we start out by looking back where David said, I once was young, now I'm old. You see, every day that you spend in life cannot be repeated. You know, you're all, you're the next day after some event happens, you look back and say, wow, God took care of me. Well, understand this, you're one day older than you were yesterday. The next day you'll be two days older. You continue getting older, but you can't go back. But every day, not only should you be getting older, you should be getting wiser. You should become more mature, more stable in the Christian life. And that is not for you to hog to yourself. That is to go and help people, tell them. Because I can tell you this again, young people, you can save a lot of time and you can save a lot of study and go through a lot of experiences. But if you'd have just gone to an older person in the first place, just tell them, I'm going through this. Could you tell me what you did? And listen, experiences haven't changed. I don't care if it's technology, things like that today. The, the core of the issue is that it never changes. The problems of life are always and have always been the same, even though technology changes and you think we're living in a whole new illuminated day, the problems of life are still the problems of life. Therefore, the answers in life are always going to be the answers in life. David said again, I once was young, can't go back and repeat it, but now am I old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging bread. Knowledge from an older person should carry more weight than from a younger one. Now, people that are younger will use a point to some philosophy, some business book they read, but for somebody to point back to, I stood on the word of God, you know what? never did arrive at the same time. There's times it took months, times it took days. Sometimes with the end of the day, I had the answer. Sometimes it took two or three years before it finally came to pass. But I will say this, God worked it out in his own time. And in the meantime, I learned patience. That's why things take a while so that you can develop patience. And that's the attributes you put into the next generation. Knowledge from an older person carries more weight than from a younger one. Neither we nor our children will be forsaken or left broke and begging for bread. Verses uh, one, seven, and eight, all start with this, fret not yourself because David was addressing young people. And even though we teach them scripture and they know scripture, they watch some news program, they read something in the paper, they read some magazine, immediately they're fretting over the future. What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? Well, the Bible says, I, I know what the Bible says, but you know what? I think we gotta do something about this. We need a group to rise up and we need to go here. And that's fine on occasions to do that. I think getting involved in government and things like that is important, but understand something, you're not going to change everything. God is gonna change everything. In the meantime, he's called you to one specific thing that should outshadow everything, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And that means in your own city, that means in your own town, that means your own circumstances, the school you go to, you should be spreading the gospel, winning people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I can tell you this, the angels aren't gonna rejoice over the next president that's elected in the United States, because that's temporary. But angels do rejoice over every sinner that repents because that is eternal. So. Again, the key things that runs through this whole thing is that oftentimes young people start to fret over everything coming along. Why? Because they have no foundation behind them of the word of God and God coming through time after time after time. That's why you need to go to an older person that does have this and they can simply fill you in. You know what? 
a year from now, you look back and say, that whole thing worked itself out. Wow, and here I was sweating, fretting, mad at everything. And it was just, how, how useless was I? I was just fretting over nothing. And you can actually save yourself all of that by going to an older person. And as David said, I once was young, now I'm old, but I can tell you this, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Proverbs 24 and verse 19 says this, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the wicked. You know, sometimes we fret because we see people out there breaking the law, living evil lives, and it comes out the corruption that goes on behind. It says, but listen, don't fret yourself over the next, next of all says, don't be envious of the wicked. Look, they bypassed everything. They didn't even have a normal job, but they, you know, they got involved in crime and look at how long they got away with it and look at all the prosperity they had. Listen, they have to live with a conscience and most of them don't have a conscience, but if you're born again, you have a conscience and a good conscience is part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Second Timothy chapter three and verse 13 says this, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now he didn't tell you this for you to fret over it, God, Paul told Timothy this for you to understand what's going to happen. The world is not going to get better. The world's going to get worse and worse and worse. The only salvation the world has is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the setting up of his millennial ten, uh, his kingdom. So the young tend to get overwrought about evil in the world. And the word fret in the Hebrew means to kindle, to wax hot. Don't get burn up. And listen, there's times when you'll start to fret. Stop it. If you don't stop it, you're going to get burned up and consumed by this issue. And by the time you get halfway into it, starting to help settle it, another thing's going to break out. You'll find yourself chasing fires from now on. So fret means to worry. And what the scripture is saying is do not worry. And what we're not to worry over is evildoers. Proverbs 24 and verse 19, again, we quoted it and says, and don't be envious of the wicked. So don't worry about these things. In fact, worry is one of the worst things found in the word of God. And Jesus spoke so often about it. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. Take your worries and cast them on the Lord. He will sustain you. Next time you hear something, oh, listen, the, the, the tendency to want to worry about something is always there. And as soon as you settle something, say, I'm not going to worry about this. Something else comes along from a totally different direction on a totally different issue. And your first thought is, what are we going to do about this? Is there anybody handling Does anybody, am I the only one that knows about this? The answer is no. Hang on. The God that took care of the last one and the one before it will take care of this one. And like I said, this is a great time when you go to church to just sit down beside some older person and say, you know what? How long have you been saved? They might tell you, well, I've been saved for 40 years. You know, well, listen, I'm facing this situation. I don't know if you ever had, and they'll probably laugh at you and go, yeah, we faced it. We had the same problems. There's, there's no new problems. They just come up, you know, from time to time. We stick a different title on it, but it's the same old problem that's always come along. And this is how God dealt with it in my life. And listen, take notes on that because why? You're going to save yourself a lot of worry, a lot of time, a lot of trouble, and you can get back to doing what God told you to do while you cast your burden on the Lord. So in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13, that's what it says. But here in this particular Psalm that we're talking about that David wrote toward all those, again, younger than his day, Psalm 37, it says in verse 1, fret not yourself because of evildoers. An evildoer is more than just an average sinner. He's one that's under the control of evil and it's author Satan. And we are seeing so much of this today. When we come back, we'll talk about this. Again, you can have your copy of this book of Leadership Secrets of David the King. And the announcer is going to tell you how you can have one. Godly promotion seems always to come in steps. Slow growth allows us to learn valuable lessons on the way up. So once we reach the top, we can stay there and truly enjoy the benefits of success. It took many years from the time that David was anointed king until he became king of Israel. Those who advance too quickly because of their own efforts and talents often find the descent quicker than the ascent. Pastor Bob Yandian has based this book, Leadership Secrets of David the King, on Psalm 131, which reveals the secrets of David's successful leadership that he learned while ruling as king over Israel. To order The Leadership Secrets of David the King, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Theology Simplified is a practical guide to foundational biblical truth. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. 
They often become disguised as complicated or deep-sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. Eight crucial doctrines are demystified. Redemption, justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, election, propitiation, and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, come to light as you read and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. In this particular psalm, again, David is talking to young people and old people, kind of dividing up this particular psalm uh, that David is doing right now in these verses of scripture, and he starts looking back on the past. And this is how he instructs young people. Listen, young people, I've been there before. Then he starts looking toward the future, about how God's going to take care of the future. And by this time, David is old, but he knows he still has a number of years yet to go. And he, he's simply saying this, the more secure you are in the past, the more secure you could be in the future. Once you know that God's taking care of you every day up until now, simply means he's going to take care of you in the future. There's a verse of scripture in Romans 8 that says we were sanctified and glorified and all this other stuff. But the last thing it talks about is we've been glorified. Uh, we've been saved. We've been, you know, God's done all these things for us and justified us. But he says whom God did all this for you is also glorified and it's past tense. Glorified is a term for having a resurrection body. When we receive a brand new body that's made of glory, not just this physical thing we have here. This will be an eternal body. And he talks about it's a glorious body. And that is past tense. What does that mean? I haven't got there yet, but God says it's a done deal. It's going to happen. I don't care what you think, what you know, you're going to end up there. In fact, God sees you a million years from now. Let's, let's put it on out there. God sees you 20 million years into the future in a resurrection body in heaven, rejoicing around the throne of God. What does that mean to me now? God says it's a done deal. Well, if it's a done deal and God says it's going to happen no matter what, then I can understand something. I'm going to make it through this problem and I'm going to make it through the next problem and I'm going to make it through the next problem and the next problem and the next problem because why? God sees me in heaven in a resurrection body. So apparently I get past all this stuff. Understanding your future is incredible. And that's why David says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, his seed begging bread. And he's speaking here to young people who have not yet come across those types of problems in great amounts. And he's simply saying, this is what your future is going to be. But the God that took care of me is going to take care of you. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Verse one of this Psalm says again, fret not yourself because of evildoers. An evildoer is more than just an average sinner. He's one who's under the control of evil and its author, Satan. And we we see that today. Here in Psalm 37, David is actually looking back to his own past to help those young people who are living today. Again, an evildoer is more than just an average sinner. He's under the control of the evil that's in this world, and Satan is the author of that evil, and Satan is part of the world system. He's the ruler of this world system. And so this person has joined himself to the plan to assist evil and is, assist Satan in taking over the world's order and eventually destroying believers from the earth and eventually Israel. This is Satan's plan for the future. Won't happen. We already told in the Bible how God's going to happen, how God's going to take care of, but Satan knows it, has read it, but he won't believe it. He still has this idea, I can do it. And so he's working behind the scenes. He thought he could do it in the garden. And even though he succeeded at the time, God kept overthrowing his plans and on the cross. Jesus Christ came and conquered him. And so Satan has been sentenced, but he has not yet gone and served that sentence. And the sentence is he's going to go to jail forever. He'll be in hell for a thousand years, then eventually in the lake of fire forever. But it hasn't been, again, that sentence has not been carried out. So we are between the point when the sentence was given to him and when, and when he will finally go to prison. And he's still saying, I can do this. I can overthrow God. And he's trying his best. So we 
do not fret because we know what will become of evildoers. We know what's going to happen to all unbelievers. And unbelievers that God's talking about in this verse of scripture, we call all kinds of things. We call them liberals. We call them radicals. We call them left wingers. All people have ideas outside the word of God. And it comes back to this man can solve his own problems. If we'll all come together and think alike and work together with all of our governments, it's going to work. No, you run into problems because those who take over are fighting for themselves. We may have a bunch of nations working together that at the beginning of the, of the tribulation is going to work out fine. But listen, the flesh is still there and certain nations are going to take over the other nations. And pretty soon there'll be one nation that will be ruling everything. Then out of that nation, there's going to be a few that want to control it to where finally you have one person that's going to want to control the whole world and have everything under them. So again, with all the things we see happening today, it's shaping up for this utopia that the world is talking about. But listen, the utopia won't come until man's is over and the millennial reign of Jesus Christ starts. So we need to get involved in prayer and action, but we don't need to get involved in worry because God's going to take care of it. Verse seven says the basically the same thing. Fret not yourself because of him who prospers in his own way. This is talking about those who prosper because of evil. They get into crime. They could be, you know, government leaders. And we're finding that out today. Government leaders involved in crime, involved in drugs and, and cartels and all these different things. And yet the point of it is it's nothing new. It's happened before. And there are evil people people who prosper in their way, but it's not God's way. Eventually, they're going to die. There's no way any of these people are going to live forever on this earth. They're going to die. And once they die, they're going to face God. So those who prosper because of evil ways are not to be envied by God's people. God's plan of prosperity is slower and built on obedience to his word and his plan for our life. So again, God's plan is slower, but you get to keep it. God brings enduring riches where the world system, it slips through their hands after a while. It's lost by the next generation. God's plan also will endure from one generation to another and to another. Or as it says of God's prosperity, if you'll follow after him, it will go to you and your children and your children's children. Those who prosper because of evil will eventually lose it. God will see to it the prosperity of the evil will be set aside for God's people. When their time comes to die, they will lose their finances to God's people because the wealth of the wicked is set aside for the just. And listen, this money we have that we even use in our pocket right now, it's part of the world system. God put it here, but the world took it over. And that's why, again, when God sends finances your way, he doesn't manufacture it in heaven, so it bypasses the world system. The money that's in your pocket might have been doing drug deals a year ago or something like that. But God simply says, listen, it's been set aside for you. They might have got it through evil things, but you don't know about it. It's just money in your hand, but now you can take it. And where they laundered it for evil, you can launder it for good. You can. It's like washing it and now using it to send forth the missionaries, those that are spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, the expansion of your church building, all the things that are going on around you, you now can become a participant. So the more you worry over evil, the more you're tempted to do evil yourself. Why? Well, why should I keep on in this normal job and sweating and doing all these things when all I got to do is just do a few little things on the side and I can say be blessed. What you're going to do is going to hurt other people and it will displease God. So don't act the way of the world because you'll end up being cursed for it. Look forward. Instead of just looking at what's going on right now, what does the word of God have to say? So again, why do we fret over evildoers? Verse two tells us they're soon going to wither. They're going to be cut down like the grass. They're going to have a short lifespan, a quick destruction. They soon will be cut off. And this means in their prime. In verse 10, it says they soon will not even exist on the earth. Verse 13 says their day is coming. That's the day of destruction. Unless they turn to God, get born again and start following him, their day of destruction is coming. It says in verse 15, their sword will enter into their own hearts. Their bows shall be broken. In other words, the devices they are using to conquer others, they're going to fall into the trap themselves. Verse 17 says their arms shall be broken. And this is what they use to pull back on their bow. So the very strength they have will be diverted and they won't be able to use the talents and the things they have learned, okay, because they were using it for wrong reasons. Verse 20, they shall perish and be burned as the fat of lambs in 
into smoke. What does that mean? There's going to come some destruction on the earth one day, and they're going to be caught up in the flames and fire of it when Jesus Christ comes back. And that's why even in the tribulation, one of the most important things to do is keep spreading the gospel, spreading the gospel, spreading the gospel. And those that are caught up in evil can give their lives to the Lord as well as everybody else on the earth that's so fearful of what's going on around them. In other words, it starts now, don't be fearful. Because why? There is coming terrible times into this earth. I know we're going up in the rapture, but I can tell you this, it's going to get worse before the rapture even comes. The world system is headed toward the tribulation. Although Antichrist can't even take his throne until we're gone, we still see the effects of Antichrist around us knowing that Antichrist system is headed toward centralized one world government. But the coming of Jesus Christ after that will be centralized worldwide righteousness as Jesus sits on the throne in Jerusalem. Verse 36 says, they shall pass away and be no more and not even be found. Verse 38, they shall all be destroyed together. That means all at one time. What are we to do? Verse three, trust in the Lord. A synonym for trust in these verses of scripture is found in verse three, and now it's found in verse four, is delight yourself in the Lord. This is how we trust in him. We delight in him, knowing God has good for us. Even in the midst of a world falling apart, he has good things for us. He still wants to give us the desires of our heart. So this is the first part of God's contract with you. And in verse five, he talks about commit your ways to him. We're now looking forward to the future. Now he says, I have been, and he was looking back on the past, now he's looking forward to the future and says, commit your ways to the Lord in verse five. He will bring it to pass. This is the second part of God's contract with you. Verse seven, rest in the Lord. You know what this means? Take his promises and understand God's gonna take care of me. Like Jesus sleeping on a pillow in the middle of the storm while the storm was throwing that ship everywhere, you in the midst of the storm can rest on a promise and there's 7,000 pillows, 7,000 promises in the word of God that you can lay your head on. So it's simply saying in verse seven, by resting in the Lord, keep your mouth shut. Don't talk back to God. Quit challenging God by rehearsing the circumstances to him. Isn't it amazing? We're always saying to God, but don't you know what's going on? Like, duh, of course he knows what's going on. It's you're the one that doesn't know what's going on because you don't know behind this problem out there, God has a promise to carry you through. Verse seven says, wait patiently. Patience produces character. Verse eight, cease from anger. Stop anger immediately. Change your attitude. Anticipate deliverance with a joyful attitude. And in verse eight, forsake wrath. Turn loose of anger. Turn loose of wrath. Quit making excuses for it. My father was this way. Well, then stop it. You're not your father. So again, take the promises of God, stand on them and decide you're going to change your life. We are forced to live in a world of evil and corruption brought on by the pride of mankind. It's a world filled with war against good and against God himself. Evil men, just like Satan, think they can conquer and overthrow God. So we don't even like to agree with the world. We shouldn't be agreeing with the world, but we know it's future and we need to be willing to patiently wait for it, standing on the promises of God. In other words, history has been pre-recorded. And we know who wins, our team wins. Revelation talks about it. The epistles of the New Testament talk about it. Old Testament prophets talked about it. There's a great time coming for the world. And again, it's pre-recorded. We know who wins, it's our team. Our team is God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Christ and Christians and believers from all dispensations and all time. What am I simply saying? The best is yet to come. Have a good day. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Visit bobyandian.com. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.